terrible situation. Terrible. A um, couple others to pray for. Um, Venus asked us to pray for um, a friend who's dealing with a mental health crisis. Um, she's bipolar and was in a manic spell. So they were very concerned last night that she was going to harm herself, but Venus was able to make contact this morning. So this young woman is physically safe as of today, but dealing with a significant crisis. And she lives far away. She doesn't live in New Jersey, so Venus can't. Whatever happened to the person in her family that had the hardware that needed to He be has surgery tomorrow. tomorrow. Oh. Yes, her cousin Chris. So she asked us to pray for Chris. Um, they're doing, I, I guess this is a, a new kind of procedure where they change how the muscle is attached to the rib cage, how the pectoral muscle attaches. Oh, wow. And it's supposed to take some of the strain off those ribs that are grinding together. But remember, Chris and Betsy also lost their daughter a couple yeah. weeks ago. Oh, so. so he's still, you know, they're still grieving and also dealing with the health crisis on top of all that. Um, and um, please pray for Lisa from Trinity. Yes. She um, was diagnosed with a recurrence of breast cancer, and she has started treatment. Um, so please pray for her. Oh, I see Cody's on with us. Hello, Cody. Glad to see you, brother. Um, and also, Jeff from Trinity has asked us to pray for his mother and his girlfriend. His mother had hip replacement surgery last week, mm -hmm. and his girlfriend is dealing with some health crises as well. So those are a few that we have. Would anyone have any other prayer requests you'd like to share? Continue praying for Toby. He's still in the hospital waiting for, for him to gain weight and wait for a kidney transplant. Andy Louise, we saw her last night at Walmart. She had her emotional support dog with her. Yeah? She said everything's going well at the job. And She's really happy that things are going well. She'll be here Saturday. Yeah, for those of you who don't know, she got a, an opportunity to apply for a promotion that would allow her to not have to do the physical labor in the warehouse. It was a training position, but it changed her days off. Mm. So they have her working on Sunday. So she's been watching online, but that's why she hasn't been able to be here in person. So. It was a hard call, but you know she was starting to have some repetitive motion issues working in the warehouse, so it was a, a good promotion. But, yeah. Well, she told us that a, a, one of the ladies that was working with her quit, so she's doing both jobs. Mm. Did she mention anything about her mother? No. no. Okay. I know Ponce is still having some trouble. My Venus job. is on with us. Hello, Venus. My job. I am very glad you got to come to church this morning. Oh, yeah, me too. I mean, that was very generous of this person. Uh, her and I were the two nurses that we were the glue last year when everybody quit. Yeah. It was just her and I. Yeah. Worky, how are things going with your volleyball team? The friends that you were praying for? Oh. Yeah? How'd you guys do? Pretty good. Pretty good, yeah? No major injuries? No. Okay, well that's good. That's good. So now you gotta start getting ready for basketball, right? Mm -hmm. I'm not playing. Oh, you're not playing basketball this year? Okay. You played basketball last year, didn't you? I did. Okay, good. I thought I was going crazy for a minute. I'm glad nobody got hurt. Live to play another year. All right, Jane is on with us as well. Hello, Jane. A um, couple, an another kind of prayer request. I know I keep mentioning these, but it's important. Um, we have um, bookmarks and prayer cards for our missionaries. Now, the name of the program has changed. It was called Links. Now they're calling it Care and Connection. 
but just so everybody knows, the way they work it is um, each year, it used to be on a three-year cycle, I'm not sure if they're going to stay that way, but they assign different missionaries to churches so that you have kind of like your personal adopt-a-missionary people. And we pray for them, and we send them cards, and um, we usually send them a gift. Um, our church is sending a Christmas gift to these families. Um, but we have a bookmark. Um, if you collect all three, you've got all the missionaries. But we also have a separate, larger print prayer card for each missionary family, if you'd like to have those. And uh, just a reminder to keep praying. Um, we have a few cool things coming up this year. Doug and Emma Solomon are going to be staying with us in December. So we're going to get to see them very soon. They're coming at the very end of November. And then in the springtime, Matt and Tammy Woodley are coming for a brief visit in May. And they are going to lead a mission event for our teens and children. So those are two really cool things coming up about missions. Um, a couple announcements to make. I don't have my bulletin in front of me, but um, we want to remember the Thanksgiving event at the mission. And I got, let me see if I can get my dates without messing this up. Um, for people who need a basket at the mission, you're supposed to call on November 7th. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh, thank you. Because I think everything's on there. And then the training is on November 17th. And that is open for... Um, if, Everyone who's volunteering, but also if you would, yep, all the information is here in the bulletin, so if you didn't get one this morning, there's more out there. Uh, the training is on the 17th at 5.30 p.m., and all are welcome to come if you would like some training and some encouragement and equipping on how to share your faith. And quite frankly, uh, we'd love to see a great contingent from Salem churches. Amen. Salem County churches. Amen. And then... Um, the Monday and Tuesday of Thanksgiving week is when the baskets will be handed out. And, and some news there. Sure. Uh, we uh, got a second call uh, from uh, our former supplier, Burris, the family Burris, who had been bought out by DJs. Mm -hmm. and, and they called back and said, we think that there ought to be turkeys available to you. How many do you need available to you? said the minimum 1500 <laughs> and, and, and they said and then they called back and said you will have 1500 oh, wow. amen and, uh, <laughs> and we'll see how many we'll see how many uh, the burris can cover amen I can't even that's amazing what that looks like that's a lot of turkeys. Yeah. God is good. That's a semi load. Full yeah, I was going to say, that's a tractor trailer. That's a tractor trailer full of turkeys. Amen. We didn't even have to wait a week for the answer to prayers. Amen. And we already got more chickens over at the church. They came too. God is good. God is good. Yes, He is. Amen. Thank you, brother. <laughs> I have to confess, I like when God answers the prayer request nice and early. <laughs> but uh, I had no doubt. I had no doubt he was going to make a way. Yeah. Tractor trailer loaded full of turkeys. Mm -hmm. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. Oh, Eric's online with us too. Hello, Eric. That's amazing. Yeah, God is good. God is good. Um, if you didn't hear this morning, we had a, a pantry board meeting this week, and we had some representatives from some other churches there again. And uh, that has been a strong prayer of ours this past year, that we would be able to partner with other churches in town and invite other people to see what's going on here. Invite other people to come and see God provide, like tractor trailers full of turkey. <laughs> and things didn't change. In fact, in, in you know, kind of the tri-state area, the avian flu is actually getting really bad right now. Um, I saw a lot of things on the news about some uh, die-offs in Pennsylvania over this past week um, and even in the midst of it all so um, yeah pastor uh, Dwight Mason and his wife Danielle from St. Ambrose they were here along with Donna and Steve Bellinger and of course our friends from Trinity were back over here and um, one of our prayers is to work to rebuild the partnerships between the churches in town 
so that we can do ministry together, so that we can serve our town together. So that's a prayer request I want to lift up. As one of the pastors involved, we're trying really hard to build these friendships and partnerships in love and in trust and in unity. So please keep praying for that for us. Um, we had a wonderful collection. Our alabaster total, we hit $1,834 last month. Amen. So we, uh, our original goal was 700 which would have been the highest we've had. And we got challenged through prayer to hit 1700 mm -hmm. And then we even broke that. So, you know, it just goes to show when we sacrifice just a little bit, God multiplies it. And that's going to go a long way to help build some churches. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, any other prayer requests anyone would like to share? All right. Don't well, forget the 500, the raise the 500. That's sure, that's an important announcement. Yeah. Um, we, got in, we found out Thursday that Thriven is doing their Race to 500 challenge again. So um, the first several pantries that collect 500 non-perishable items get a $500 donation. So uh, we, are, uh, we had several donations come in Friday. So without even knowing it, people made donations just as that count was starting. So we're just about halfway there already. So hopefully by next weekend we can hit it. That'll be real nice if we can take pictures out pantry day. Yeah, please pray for that. God is providing. God is providing. Um, we also found out that one of the other churches in town had a couple large donations come in. And they want to make sure that they're there to fill in any cracks we might have to buy food. So. Cookies. Yeah. yeah. So. I saw the ones in Walmart. They look decent. Yeah. I didn't get any, but... All right, well, start collecting turkeys, everybody. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Let's pray together. Father God, thank you for another chance to gather in your name. Thank you for the testimonies that we are hearing, Father. Thank you for providing for the mission and for so many other people. Father, 1,500 turkeys, that's 1,500 families that get to have a wonderful, warm meal. Father, thank you. Thank you for providing. Thank you for answering that prayer without even a week going by and answering it generously. Father, you are very good to us, and I pray that you help us by your spirit to keep our eyes on that, to remember how good you are to us. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the pain shouts, Father. And, um, help us to, to keep speaking of your goodness, to keep testifying of your love and your care so that we might never forget Father, we lift up Dave and Wendy Sorrells to you tonight as they are being installed um, in a new pastoral role. Father, thank you for the heart that you have given them for evangelism and worship and music. We pray for many blessings over their ministry. We pray for continued guidance of their hearts, Father. and We look forward to seeing how you use them in the kingdom. Thank you that we get to have uh, spiritual cousins all around the place. And... Uh, Thank you for the chance to celebrate along with them. Father, we lift up a friend, of a, a, a friend of a friend who's having open heart surgery tomorrow. We pray that that surgery would be without complication and that the two blockages would be dealt with. Father, we pray for this accident that occurred um, in Kansas. Father, we pray for the driver, um, for his family. It's a heartbreaking thing, Father. We thank you that the little boy who was the passenger was able to be pulled out of the truck. We pray for the driver of the combine. Um, such a traumatic, difficult situation. Father, please, please be with them. Please be with them. Father, we lift up little baby Toby. Pray that you would be with him as he is growing and putting on weight and waiting for a kidney transplant. We also lift up one of our neighbors Father, who is waiting on a kidney transplant. We pray for her as she is undergoing dialysis and the time and the toll that that takes on her. Um, we pray for her husband and her children as they are trying to minister to her and, and balance everything else as well right now. We lift up our sister Ivelisse to you as she's being swamped at work again. Um, Father, we pray that you would change her schedule once again so that she might be able to be here to worship with us in person. 
But uh, thank you, Father, for caring for Ivelisse and her family. We pray for continued protection over her mother and her aunt and her daughter and Ponce, who are still trying to recover from their damage from the last hurricane. Father, we lift up Darlene's job situation to you. We thank you that she was able to have an extra Sunday to attend with us this morning. And we pray that you would provide the nursing and uh, physical therapy staff that they need. Father, we thank you that Worky's team finished out the season without injury, and we pray that the off-season would be a time of training and building and um, of growth. Father, we lift up uh, a few families to you who are in dire straits. Um, you know their situations, Father. In both cases, there are children involved, and we pray. Um, Father, sometimes we wish we could put our hands on the situation and change it. And uh, I pray that you'd help us to be patient. Father, we know that you love these little ones even more than we do. And so we put them in your hands, Father. We entrust them to your care. Um, please be with us tonight, Father, as we share and as we, we read and as we learn. Thank you for the challenges we've been given as we've been studying the Gospel of John. And I pray, Father, that you would continue to unlock truth for us. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right, I'm going to start off with uh, a group question. Um, I don't do this every time, but we've been kind of doing it in our different meetings. I'd like to ask um, what everybody's been doing in your devotional time. Still in Psalms. Still in Psalms. Could I ask what number you might be on? Maybe 10. Maybe 10. Because we might be Psalms twin. 103? Oh, that's a good one. He knows we are a little more than dust. Mm. Amen. I feel like dust. <laughs> yeah, but he knows it and he loves us and cares for us. Amen. That's a good one. I like that. One. I like that. One. What was that? I told Carol there wasn't dirt in my pocket. That was dust. Oh, that was dust in your pocket. Okay. It was lint. <laughs> Would anyone else like to share what you've been reading in your devotions? Maybe. Uh, a song that's been in your heart or a verse that's been on your mind? I've just been rereading everything that we've been studying on Ezekiel and John. Just Some deep water there. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Letting it all sink in. I have a friend, um, Ken, his name's Ken. Um, he and his wife um, are missionaries out in Colorado, but he one one year he spent six months where every week he read through the Gospel of John. He read through the whole Gospel of John every week. He read, you know it's a few chapters a day. You can get through the book in a week, and he did that for six months. Yeah, it's an interesting plan. Yeah. Um, for me, there's a lot there. Yeah, there is. There is. I I felt I, I kind of deviated a little bit. I've been I've been I have been reading. My utmost for his highest, but as I was preparing for tonight's lesson and talking about Jesus going up to Jerusalem, the last few days I went back into the Psalms of Ascent. So starting at Psalm 120, there are a series of Psalms that are meant to be sung as people travel into Jerusalem. I like to imagine that maybe as Jesus was traveling, he was thinking of some of these Psalms. Um, we can be pretty sure that his family and friends would have sung some of these as they were traveling when he was young. So, uh, I, uh, Psalm 121, of course, is one of my favorites. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. That's the song. Yeah. But I also, um, the beginning of 122 is one that I have been praying over. Um, I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. And now here we are standing inside your gates, O Jerusalem. I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Isn't that a privilege? Mm -hmm. I was thinking of our creative access missionaries and um, you know Janice's family who are dealing with situations where they it's, it's not safe to publicly worship Jesus and, and the risk that people take to do it because it's so vital. And 
and what a gift it is that we get to do this. Yeah. Would anyone else like to share anything? We're going to have lots more opportunities, but I am going to keep asking. So. Okay, well, we are in... Oh, Venus said she has restarted Ezekiel. All right, well, you've got some tough water to tread there, Venus, so if you need some support, we're here for you. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah. Ezekiel's a big bite to chew. So... I guess we can get back into John. We are in John chapter 7. Does anybody remember what was going on last week when we left off? Jesus was with some people. Do you remember? His brothers, yes. And do you remember what the, his brothers were getting ready to do? Go into Jerusalem for the festival. Yes, they were going into Jerusalem for a festival. The festival of booths, yes. yes. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And they wanted Jesus to go with them. Um, do you remember how they kind of felt about Jesus at that moment? That he should show himself to people if he wants to be known. Mm. Basically, I think they were mocking him. Well, chapter 7, verse 5 that we read last week says, his brothers did not believe in him. So when they say what they said, it does sound like they, um, yeah, they were poking a little bit, mm -hmm. which had to be hard. You Hi, Marty. Right Good to see you, brother. Too. Yeah. All right. So his brother said, come with us, but they kind of had ulterior motives. Jesus said, no, this isn't the right time. But then later, Jesus does go into Jerusalem by himself, without his brothers. Okay? And that's where we are. So we're going to jump in at verse 10. Jesus is in Jerusalem at the temple. Um, can somebody read verses 10 to 13 for us, please? Yeah, I can do it. Thank you, brother. But after his brothers left for the festival, Jesus also went though secretly staying out of public view. The Jewish leaders tried to find him at the festival and kept asking if anyone had seen him. There was a lot of grumbling about him among the crowds. Some argued he's a good man, but others said he's nothing but a fraud who deceives the people. But no one had the courage to speak favorably about him in public, for they were afraid of getting in trouble with the Jewish leaders. Thank you. So this is right where we paused last week, but I wanted to step back in here. So his brothers have gone ahead. Jesus now decides to go, but he's staying out of public view. And what's going on in Jerusalem concerning Jesus? Who's thinking what kinds of things? Yeah. People are afraid to speak up. Who are they afraid of? The Jewish the leader of the Jews. Yeah. Also the Jews. The leaders, yeah. 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 I, I would guess there might be a little bit of fear of the Romans mixed in there too. Mm -hmm. um, the Romans tended to not really be kind to people they saw as rising leaders in the people, people who had the ability to stir up the populace. But yeah, mostly it was an issue with the Jewish leaders. Now, just as a little recap, this festival was a festival that many Jewish people traveled for to come into Jerusalem to celebrate together. And so the city was very crowded with a lot of Jewish people from the surrounding villages and towns. Right? A lot of people had crowded into Jerusalem for this event. It's a big deal. And there's lots of grumbling amongst the crowds. What tends to happen when you have grumbling and crowds? Mm -hmm. riots. Yeah, the pot tends to boil over, right? Yeah. So you can see that this is a, a tense situation. It's one that has to be navigated carefully. A lot of misinformation. Let's talk about that misinformation for a minute. You, you're referring to what the people were saying about Jesus? 
Yeah, and I was wondering whether or not it was both the Jewish leaders and the Romans, or one or the other, that were saying that he was deceiving the people. Well, this says among the crowds, but as a general rule, crowds get their information from somewhere, right? So clearly, um, well, not clearly, but as we go through chapter 7, later on, there are some people who have seen firsthand or heard from credible witnesses what Jesus has done, and they have a pretty strong opinion about him. These people, it sounds like they're going more on hearsay, like they're going more on the gossip, right? And some are saying, um, well, he's a good man, and some are saying he's a fraud. And Pastor Tom made a comment about this as we were closing last week. That's why I wanted to touch on it again. If Jesus is a fraud, what does that mean for this movement? It's not going to succeed. It's not going to succeed. It's going to crumble. If Jesus is just a good man, what does that mean for the movement? He might have some good things to say to people. But he's not the Messiah, right? Right. Yeah. So if he's just a good man or if he's a fraud, either way... That's not the Messiah. Yeah, it's not the Messiah. And that's kind of where we closed off, talking about some other groups in our society today who use that good man argument. And some take it a little further. Some might use the word prophet, the title prophet. But they fall short of of recognizing Jesus as the Son of God. And um, that can create some tension, right? Um, I was talking with another pastor on Thursday and he was saying that in their town they had a ministerium like a group of churches and there was a church that wanted to join that did not confess Jesus as the son of God and um, he said their solution was to have a creedal statement as their mission statement of the ministerium right so there's a confessional statement that Jesus is Lord when you join the group so if you don't confess that you can't join the group um, and that was how they dealt with it. But this is, this is still an issue, right? People read the Bible and they recognize that there's truth here. There's power to these words. I mean, the Sermon on the Mount, I mean, it is a, it is a moving work. Mm-hmm. It's very moving and very challenging. Um, but some people fall short of full belief in Jesus. Mm-hmm. And that's actually one of the themes of this chapter, right? People who recognize that Jesus has something good to teach or maybe even something good to offer, but people who are not willing to fully accept his lordship and his sovereignty. What denomination was that church? Or what was that? Uh, that particular group, they were Mormon, but they're not, that's not the only group that we have that issue. Oh. Yeah. Okay, so... We're in Jerusalem, the crowd's grumbling, people are thinking all kinds of things, and so far, Jesus has stayed out of public view. But clearly, everybody's talking about it, right? So, let's go next. Can somebody read verses 14 to 20, please? I got it. Thank you. About the middle of the festival, Jesus went up into the temple and began to teach. The Jews were astonished at it, saying, How does this man have such learning when he has never been taught? Then Jesus answered them, My teaching is not mine, but his who sent me. Anyone who resolves to do the will of God will know whether the teaching is from God or whether I am speaking on my own. Mm. Those who speak on their own seek their own glory, but the one who seeks the glory of him who sent him is true, and there is nothing false in him. You want me to go to 20, he says? Yes, please. Did not Moses give you the law, yet none of you keeps the law? Why are you looking for an opportunity to kill me? The crowd answered, you have a demon. Who is trying to kill you? Okay. So, it might have seemed like maybe Jesus was trying to just experience the festival personally and privately, right? Mm Mm-hmm. But is that what he does? When and where does he choose to reveal himself? Midway and where? Right. In the middle at the temple, right? 
So all the latecomers, all the stragglers who hit traffic on the way in, you know, there was a donkey pile up, you know, <laughs> they've all made it, right? Everybody's there. And what's, where's the focal point of everybody in Jerusalem? The temple, right? So even though Jesus entered the city privately, he has put himself right at the middle of everything. Right? So just as a first question, why do you think he might do that? If he was going to put himself in the middle, why did he enter in private? It's not about him. It's not about him. Do you remember what his brothers said he should do? Go and make himself known. Yeah, claim your glory. Make yourself known. Yep. Right? Do your tricks. Shut everybody's mouth. Yeah. So he's there and he's, what, is he performing lots of miracles? No. He's not. He's teaching. But even though he's not performing signs and wonders, how does the crowd react at, at first when they hear him teaching? Verse 15. They want to know how he learned all these things. Yeah, how does he know so much? How can he teach like this? Now, it's not the first time we've heard a comment like this about Jesus, right? right. Yeah, even when he was a, well, yeah, a young fellow. Yeah. 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 So how does the temple teaching like that work? Can anybody just walk up there and start teaching? <clears throat> That's an excellent question. There is a little bit of nepotism involved, but basically, in order to be a recognized teacher, you had to be the student of a recognized teacher, okay? So much like somebody might pop on the evening news and they would say, Harvard professor so-and-so says this, all right? What does that imply about the person? And they're in debt, but yes, right? <laughs> yeah, it implies that they know something. And so that was what was generally common. You had um, and, and this goes back a while, not, not just in Jewish culture, it was something in Greek and Roman culture too, but what you'd call schools of thought. Have you ever heard that phrase, school mm -hmm. of thought? Well, that goes back to this tradition of one learned teacher having a group of people that would study under them. Okay? Um, do you guys ever hear of the architect Frank Lloyd Wright? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Frank Lloyd Wright had an architect school, and he had groups of... Um, well-trained professional architects who gave up their careers to come and study under him, and he started a school. And so by association, their names became prestigious because they studied under Frank Lloyd Wright. So um, when Paul talks about his training, he talks about the person he studied under, right? Gamaliel, the priest, right? So by quoting who you studied under, that was like your diploma, okay? The difference is, when Jesus teaches, he does not do that. He does not claim authority because he taught under a respected teacher. Right? He speaks as one who has authority. Right? So, it's a very good question, but that's the difference. He doesn't say, you guys should listen to me because I studied under Billy Graham. Right? He doesn't do that. He comes and he speaks with authority. And it's so powerful that even though he's not pulling those strings, people are still like, man, this, there's something special here. Right? There's something special here. So just like um, you'd have a, an apprentice who studies under a journeyman to learn a trade, it was the same way with, with rabbis. It's a little bit of a simplification, but that idea. So he's there, he's teaching, he's not claiming authority, but he's speaking at the temple and people are listening. Yeah. Um, in verse 16, Jesus addresses that question. How does he know so much when he's not been trained? What is Jesus' res his personal response to that question in verse 16? Not his, it's his father's. Yeah. The one who sent it comes him. from God. It comes from God. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This is when everybody's eyes get real big, right? He's claiming to have a message from God speak directly from God. He, he doesn't just say, my message is God's. He goes a step further. He says the message comes from God who did what? Sent him. Yeah. He doesn't just say he's speaking God's message. He's saying God sent him. Mm -hmm. I am the one sent from God. Right? So this is when everybody's you know, ears are perking up. 
the spidey senses are tingling, right? There's something different going on here, something powerful, something very powerful. He goes further, and he's done this before, but this time he's doing it in a large crowd at a festival in Jerusalem. He's drawing the line in the sand, right? He's drawing the line in the sand. Anyone who wants to do the will of God will know whether my teaching is from God or merely my own. What does that imply when you have all these people running around saying, is he a good man? Is he a charlatan? Is he a, uh, uh, what does it imply about all those people with those questions? Should show them off. They're not listening to God. Right. right? He's saying if, if you don't recognize him as coming from God, you're not listening to God. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, if you are one of those teachers of the law who had just spent the whole first half of the festival telling the crowds that this man Jesus was not from God, how are you going to feel when Jesus says this? Like a dummy. Like a dummy? I mean, offended, right? Personally yeah. offended. Yeah. It's, it, it is an inflammatory statement. Yeah. So this is something that, you know, I've heard talked about a lot in different circles. Um, this idea of making the gospel more palatable or sharing the gospel in a way that is not offensive. Now, I I do try not to be offensive. (laughs) I try not to be offensive. Do you think it's possible to share the gospel with a lost person without it being a little bit offensive? No. You have to set them on the right path. Yeah. And the only way way to do it is to tell them the truth. A few of us were talking about this earlier, right? If, if we are going to be forgiven, what do we have to do in order to be forgiven? Yes, for forgiven. Repent. Repent, right? Like John the Baptist said. I, you really need to start carrying that puppet with you all the time. <laughs> <laughs> repent. And what does it mean to repent? Turn, away. Turn the other way. And don't do it again. And don't do it again. Yeah. But... <laughs> I can't, if, if I never confess that I'm doing something wrong, can I repent? No. No, no. Um, I, heard, uh, I heard somebody preach on, on this topic by talking about GPS, right? How if you've got your GPS set and you miss a turn, like you miss your right turn, it tells you to take the next right turn. But eventually, if you keep going the wrong way, what does it tell you to do? Turn around. Yeah, just turn around and go back. Like, man, it's too, you just, you got to turn around. You're too far. You're too far, of course. Yeah. If we don't listen to the GPS, if I'm like, you know what? No GPS. I know what I'm doing. What happens? You get lost. You get really lost. You get more and more lost. Yeah, you get more and more lost. Yeah. So that's why Jesus needs to speak this way, right? He's come to bring light into the darkness. He's come to help those who are lost to be found. And if he's going to do that, he's got to speak the truth. And these people who are in power, who built their whole lives around believing things a certain way, when Jesus challenges that, that brings about tension. Right? And that's just it. When he's challenging them, he's taking what they were taught, the Old Testament rules. And well, he's saying, well, you have heard it said, but I say, and he changes the rules. He refers to that in verse 19, right? Well, We'll do 19, then we'll come back to 18. He says, Moses gave you the law, and you don't even listen to that. Yeah. Right? Not only are they not recognizing Jesus as coming from God, they're not following the law of Moses, and not only are they not recognizing him as coming from God, they're trying to kill him. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. But let's... There's a, I, I, think it's, I think it's helpful, and it, this is what, uh, by the way, if, if you've spoken about... Uh, Pastor Kerry going to, to Israel and, mm-hmm. and uh, the trips to Israel. And if you haven't gone and you get a chance to go, you make the effort. But uh, he's talking to you about that. Yeah, because you you get to see you get to, you put a picture to it, and uh, one of the sites that you typically see 
in Jerusalem, besides going up to the Temple Mount, uh, and you, you typically can get up there and you'll see the Mosque of Omar and, and, uh, and other things. But what you'll also see in Jerusalem, you'll see a scale model that you'll get be able to walk around of old Jerusalem, Jerusalem in Jesus' time. And you get to see, you, 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 it's one thing to see it from pictures and another thing to see it from our maps in the back of our Bibles. It's really something else to see it right there in front of you. And you mm -hmm. begin to imagine certain things. One of the things is uh, this, where this takes place and, and the picture that we're, you should be seeing. It, it is like a couple football fields uh, put together. And it's the only place in Jerusalem that is, has that big, wide, open space. Mm. And so if a crowd is going to gather, that's where it's going to gather. Mm. And for that reason, uh, the Romans made sure they had a garrison right on the top of the wall there. And so they, they had, the Romans were there. It's also where Herod uh, made sure that he was watching over. So and that he would be seen. He, uh, <laughs> yeah. But around the edges, uh, there are, uh, you know, all of us have been probably to D.C. and see all these buildings with these colonnades. And all around, uh, you know, about three, uh, I think three, maybe four of the edges are these colonnades and uh, steps leading up to the colonnades. And this is where, uh, uh, these are the areas where the teachers would congregate. And you could have multiple teachers congregate because you would have the ability to stand up above the crowd a little bit. And your background is these colonnades. So it gives you authority. Uh, you know, it's a big, it, just like you could imagine. And project your voice too. And project your voice. Yeah. You know, if you're going out over this this football field on one side of the temple, and the temple's walls are bouncing it back, and and so forth. So you have that kind of phenomenon. And in and if you can imagine, now they the Roman garrison there, but in this crowd they're saying, you wonder who he's speaking to, and when they responding, yet said, why are you trying to kill me? And oftentimes, we probably would, and it's true, uh, we'd be going to uh, maybe the Pharisees or the Sadducees, but also it would be roaming throughout these crowds, the temple guard. Uh, the temple guard was prominent in all of this space. Mm -hmm. And so they were there at every speaker's crowd, probably and watching and listening and reporting back and getting orders to do what, what they should do if such and such occurred um, and so forth. And of course, this is where Jesus threw out the money changers and for previously. So Jesus shows up again and what are you doing here now? <laughs> and, uh, and so forth. So the picture is, is uh, full of lots of little pieces here that uh, he's we're, we're we're not seeing here, but we are seeing. This is this is that picture. He's up in the colonnades. He's speaking. He's bouncing off the temple walls, and that's when he's saying. And now he's got an abundance of temple guards coming coming in and, and reporting back and forth, and the people are getting really nervous. Yeah. Are those temple guards Romans? Or, or no, they're Jewish temple guards. Oh, okay. It was the one place where they really where they had any real authority. And, and and quite frankly, the Romans weren't welcome in that space because it was Jewish space. Right. Right. And this goes back to some things that happened under uh, some previous invaders. But having Gentiles in the temple was a big no-no, and that's part of what led to the Maccabean revolt um, and and some of the the tension that happened there. But yeah, the the, the Jewish leaders had religious authority. They had authority over religious matters and over the temple. They did not have authority over the whole city of Jerusalem. Right. So this was kind of their Super Bowl, right? 
This was, um, as a general rule, Rome did not allow crowds to gather on their own because riots were a big problem in these conquered areas. But these festivals were the one time that Rome would let these large crowds gather. And like Pastor Tom said, this is the one place in the city where you could really have a crowd like that. And it's a place for everybody to flex, right? The Roman soldiers are on the outside want to see, you want to see how strong they are. Herod wants to show everybody how strong he is. And now you've got the temple guards. They want to show how tough the Sanhedrin are. And what is supposed to be a temple to God has now become a pageant to earthly authority. And in the midst of it, um, just as a little bit of a recap, this festival was meant um, to celebrate or to remember, sorry, to remember the time that the people wandered in the wilderness between Egypt and the Promised Land, a time when they were led by Moses. So they are coming to Jerusalem to practice this remembrance of obedience to Moses and, and the word he spoke as a prophet of the Lord. And in the midst of that, Jesus is saying, you don't listen to the law of Moses. They're there to follow the law and to demonstrate publicly that they're following the law. And Jesus is saying, you're not following the law. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, and much like when we, we had with the tables overturned with the money changers, right? This is not what my father's house was meant to be. This pageantry of strength of, well, I've got my guard and you've got your guards and who, you know, I've got more people listening to me. That's what it was all about, right? Yeah. And here in the midst of it, we have Jesus. And he could have performed signs and wonders, right? He could have stood on the top of those steps and done something. He could have, like, shot flames at whatever, you know. He could have done some big supernatural display in order to convince the people, you know, I am the Messiah, you must listen to me. But does he do that? No. That's no. not what it's about. He teaches. Mm -hmm. He teaches. Yeah, really interesting. Jesus is not using the methods of those other people. Here's something else to consider, right? Herod, he has his guards. The Roman governor, he's got his guards. The Sanhedrin, they've got their guards. Who does Jesus have? His brothers. Well, he's got the angel army, that's true. But as far as earthly power goes, he doesn't even have the disciples with him. Remember, he sent the disciples out. He's alone. He stands alone in this crowd full of all these people who want to kill him. These people who are trying to pretend they're so strong. And he stands alone. He stands alone. Yeah. I'd love to hear the conversation that his brothers were having while he was up front. Well, we get to hear a little bit from his brothers later in the New Testament. But yeah, it's interesting. It's interesting. So the crowd, um, you know, we've, they're stirring. Jesus says... Moses gave you the law, but none of you obey it. He doesn't even say a lot of you. He says none of you. So he's calling out everybody, right? None of you obey it. In fact, you're trying to kill me. So when Jesus confronts them, when he is offensive in his portrayal of the truth, how does the crowd respond in 20? Do they get on their knees and bow and worship? No, no. And confess their sin? You're demon-possessed. Yeah. You're demon-possessed. Yeah, they pushed the back. They pushed it back on him, yeah. 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 This is where false teachings can be so alluring. Right? And this is something that our culture really, really struggles with. Mm -hmm. As we're dealing with the postmodern influence and everybody saying, I can choose what I believe and what I don't believe. It's really easy for us to listen to a false teaching that affirms the thing that keeps us comfortable and keeps us safe and keeps us in power. It's really comfortable to lean on that. That's why it's so tempting. That's why it's so tempting. Jesus is trying to confront that directly. He's trying to confront it directly. So they are pushing back. He's speaking. And so Jesus, he's not going to let them slide on this. The people are saying out loud, you're possessed from the devil. And he lays right back at them. Um, not in a vindictive way, but he's countering what they say. Verses 21 to 24. Jesus replied, I did one miracle on the Sabbath, and you were amazed. But you work on the Sabbath too, when you obey Moses' law of circumcision. Actually, 
This tradition of circumcision began with the patriarchs long before the law of Moses. Mm -hmm. For if the correct time for circumcising your son falls on the Sabbath, you go ahead and do it so as not to break the law of Moses. So why should you be angry with me for healing a man on the Sabbath? Look beneath the surface so that you may judge correctly. They're breaking the law to keep the law. Yeah, so this is um, one of those complicated issues, right, where sometimes you have two laws that are in conflict with each other, and you have to decide which law supersedes the other, right? So you have the commandment to honor the Sabbath, okay? And so they've made a rule about that, which means you don't work. And they've listed all these things that count as work. But there are a, a few exceptions to this rule, okay? One of them is for the Levites, right? And Jesus references this in another place. That the, the Levites who are called to serve in the temple do their work on the Sabbath because they're called to by God, right? Um, there's another one that it is you are able to break that law about work if it's to save a life, right? If someone's life is endangered, you're allowed to take more steps or lift more things or, or do those kinds of things if it is to save a life, okay? And then another one here is the, the timing of the circumcision was very specific. So a certain number of days after a little baby boy was born, he had to be circumcised and blessed and they had a naming ceremony and lots of other things that are complicated that I don't know. Um, and if that fell on the Sabbath, they would not, you, you weren't supposed to do it early, but you also weren't supposed to do it late. You're supposed to do it right when you're commanded to. So if that fell on the Sabbath, you were allowed to go ahead and have the gathering and cook the food and bring the people together and have the circumcision and do all those things. So, Let's backtrack just a tiny bit now that we've talked about the law. Jesus says, I did one miracle on the Sabbath, what, and you were mad at me? You were astonished. Astonished, yeah. Yeah. But after that happened, they said he was possessed of the devil. <laughs> and the teachers of the law said he was a heretic. Right? Yeah. Now, why is it significant that he performed a miracle on the Sabbath. Is this something that they just saw regularly? What does the fact that he was able to perform this sign mean? That he was able to perform the sign. It's from God, right? Yeah. So he taught, they were amazed. He said something they didn't like. They say he's from the devil. He performs a miracle. They love it. But it challenges some of the status quo. They say he's from the devil, right? And he's saying, you do, you do this all the time. He's calling them out, right? He's saying, you're not challenging me. Sorry, Jesus is saying, he's not being challenged actually on a legal basis. They're trying to use a loophole to try to get rid of him. Trying to use a loophole to get rid of him. It's heartbreaking, really. Because the people who are doing this are the people who dedicated their lives to studying the law. And yet, they kind of miss out on it. Do you think we ever do that? Do you think we ever dedicate ourselves to studying God's word and then miss something really important? Probably, yeah. Yeah. That's why it's alive. I mean, the more you study it and read it, the less you'll miss, yeah. hopefully. But I think there's two kinds of ignorance there. There is an ignorance of immaturity, right? The I haven't learned it yet, or I haven't gotten deep enough to learn that part yet, right? There, there's that kind of ignorance. But there's also a willful ignorance. Yeah. I'm choosing to focus on one thing over the other because the thing that I focus on supports what I want or what I, what I think or what I believe or what I like. So, I don't know, I might get into trouble here, I don't know, but this is kind of where I stand a little bit with just war theory, right? Um, when it comes to violence, right? If we want to be on the attacking end, we use God to justify it. God would want us to do this, right? If we're on the receiving end, oh, it's wrong for you to do that. 
if someone is our ally and they're fighting somebody, we, we, we say it's justice. If someone's not our ally, we say it's, it's terrible, it's horrible. When Jesus spoke in the Sermon on the Mount, what did he say about violence? Turn the other cheek. He said, you know, even you're not supposed to commit woman. murder, but even hate yeah. is the same as committing murder. Don't even hate. You know, and like looking at a woman and thinking mm-hmm. what the same is doing. So Jesus, he's not watering down the law. In fact, he's getting to, to the, the concentrated heart of it. But we don't always like to hear that. The Sermon on the Mount is just one that I'm, it's a very powerful summary of a lot of Jesus' teachings. If we as a church, and I don't mean we Pennsville Church of Nazarene, I mean we Christians across the globe. If we followed the Sermon on the Mount, I think Christianity in our, in our world would be very different. I think Christianity in our country would definitely be very different. So, as we pointed out before, and I appreciate Pastor for bringing this up, the Pharisees were not monolithic. It wasn't like every Pharisee thought the same thing. Um, There were some that were sympathetic. There were some that were not. Some of them were just ignorant. They didn't know yet. And they come around. You could maybe put Nicodemus in this. I know he kind of straddles the line. But he's someone who is trying to find out what's going on. But then you have the other people who are willfully ignorant. Right? Someone like Caiaphas. Yeah. Yeah. They don't want to know the truth. Right. And they're gonna they're gonna use God's law as a weapon to bludgeon anything that challenges their their power. Yeah. So we've got to be careful that we don't fall into this, right? I think Nicodemus did charge Christ. I think there's a good argument for that. I mean, we don't know for sure, but I think there's a good argument. There's a good argument for that. But I'm I'm just saying this. It can be easy to roll through a section like this and treat the the teachers of the law, the the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the Sanhedrin, to treat them as a caricature, right? As a straw man, an easy argument to defeat. Oh, well, I would never do that, you know. But if we're honest, we do this kind of thing. We do this sometimes. Look beneath the surface so you can judge correctly. Does anybody's translation say verse 24 a little bit differently? Do not judge by appearance, but judge with right judgment. What does that mean to judge by appearance? You look at someone and think stereotypical things. To judge a book by its cover, stereotypical things, yeah. Yeah. We do that a lot, right? That's kind of how our brains are wired. The human brain is wired for pattern recognition, so when we encounter something novel, we try to put it in a box. You know, this person is friendly, this person is not friendly. This person is safe, this person is not safe. Right? We we kind of make those rapid judgments without even really thinking. Take a look at David Crowder. Sure. If you saw David Crowder at a gas station, you might walk to the other side. But when, man, when you hear him saying something different, John the Baptist could be a wonderful example, right? It's a little off the beaten path. Yeah. I know this isn't exactly gospel truth, but in in the in the chosen in that video series, um, Peter jokingly refers to John the Baptist as Creepy John. (laughs) Right? Because I mean, he's a little different, right? He was. Yeah, but Jesus was a little bit different too, right? Exactly. You know, most of the teachers of that day, and we're circling around to where we started with Charlene's question, they would have dressed very formally in their robes. They had their fancy hats, a lot like our Catholic brothers and sisters wear. Um, they would have been well groomed. They would have been perfumed, right? They would have spoken eloquently. They would have been well educated. They would be friends with the right people and hang out at the right places and all those kinds of surface things, right? But Jesus makes some comments about things on the surface, right? He uses the phrase whitewashed tomb. Something that is painted bright white and clean on the outside, but is rotten on the inside. Or as we read in Ezekiel a little bit ago, the 
the teachers who were supposed to repair a wall, but instead just whitewashed it. It was still broken, but they just made it look nice on the outside. Right? Like putting Bondo on a car instead of fixing the dent. Right? Or duct tape. Yeah. Jesus is saying, you've got to look beneath the surface. Because these people who are in power, they're good at manipulating things in order to stay in power. But we have to be careful to listen for God's voice. Now you and I, we have a very special gift that these people did not have. See, we live at a time after Pentecost, right? We live at a time after the Holy Spirit has been poured out. So we have an extra tool that's at our disposal in our hearts that they didn't have access to in the same way. I'm not saying the Holy Spirit didn't exist. I'm not saying the Holy Spirit didn't speak to people. But not poured out on all people like today, right? The barriers had not been broken down yet before Jesus' death and resurrection and before Pentecost. So we have something special when it comes to judging correctly and looking beneath the surface. But this requires a sensitivity, right? It requires that we pay attention. Um, this happens with new leaders in the church, right? It seems like every few months somebody writes a book or writes a song or goes on a talk show and they're the new person that everybody needs to follow. But a lot of those people tend to be a flash in the pan who are trying to line their pockets, right? Jesus, however, he's proven to be true. Right? Or and or, he's proven himself true. Over and over. Right. So let's do... Um, 709. Yeah, let's do one more section. Can somebody read verses 25 to 27 for me, please? Sure. Thank you. Good one, Carol. <laughs> yeah. I don't know who I was saying sure to. <laughs> <laughs> Some of the people who lived in Jerusalem started to ask each other, isn't this the man they are trying to kill? But here he is, speaking in public, and they say nothing to him. Could our leaders possibly believe that he is the Messiah? But how could it be? For we know where this man comes from. When the Messiah comes, he will simply appear. No one will know where he comes from. Thank you. Why did they have that notion? Okay, so we've got a good thing that we've got, we've got a positive and a negative here that we've got to explore. Where we just ended verse 24, um, or it, it, sorry, not 24. Um, in verse 19, Jesus says, you're trying to kill me. And the crowd says, who's trying to kill you? You're crazy. You're possessed by a demon, right? But then, when we get down here, in verse 25, what do they say about Jesus? Isn't this the man they're trying to kill? Yeah. Okay. So, you see, right, that the, the crowd, that whole you're possessed by a demon thing, that was just smoke and mirrors, right? Um, Faked. Oh, okay. We're not even gonna go there. Um, yeah. Isn't the crowds are saying, isn't this the man they're trying to kill? But here he is speaking in public, and they say nothing to him. Why is this an issue? Well, I, I don't. I don't think that the first thing is is smoke and mirrors. Uh, I, I I really don't. I think they honestly that was an honest reaction. We think your demon is this. Uh, or the better, maybe we would say it is, oh, you're insane. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you're out of here. Try to dismiss him. Uh, okay. Yeah, because it's the crowd. This, <laughs> is, this is not, um, this is not, the, the term the Jews usually refer to influenced by the leaders of the Jews. Mm -hmm. And this is rather the multitude, the crowd. Mm -hmm. And they're, they got a bunch of people. In there, and uh, and so and so, you know, it's not. Uh, I I think they were honestly saying it, but then it's it's clear that he says uh, that some of the some of the people uh, began to ask at that time. Hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. We've heard about this guy. 
Isn't isn't this? Yeah, they they are trying to kill him. Uh, and yeah. here he is speaking against them, and yet they're not trying to kill him. Yeah, and so what is? And thus comes the question: Have they now concluded he really is the Messiah? Because they're not trying to kill him, and it looks and he's talking like this and doing these things. Maybe he is. Because going back to our first part, he is, as you've said already, he is less speaking like a teacher, a student of Gamaliel, like Paul, and more speaking like a prophet. And they haven't heard a prophet in 400 years. 400 years. And the next prophet that's supposed to come is the Messiah. And, and so this is now it's getting really close. Yeah. So I, I think that the, if you follow the the the, uh, the tree gram here, as it were, it's uh, we got a crowd filled with a bunch, and uh, and in this in this uh, in front of this colonnade, and then a group comes over and, and starts joining in and, and says, uh, yeah, but. Maybe this is real. Oh, maybe. Um, and I'm now it's almost getting exciting. And I'm wondering, okay, um, now do we have the the guards and the Roman guards and Herod's guards all rushing in now to uh, <laughs> stop the riot that's about to occur? Mm -hmm. That's what's so interesting about Jesus is he he doesn't behave like others have. He doesn't seek power. He doesn't seek an army. Right? He's not trying to turn the crowd into a weapon against the Romans or the Pharisees. But he's also not standing there with the bodyguard either. And he's clearly not being ignored by the teachers of the law because they're having these arguments with him. The crowd knows that the teachers want to get rid of him. They want to kill him. But also they're afraid to challenge him, even though here he is standing alone. They could have killed him. They could have gotten away with it. Mm -hmm. huh? <clears throat> what gets me is when the people in the crowd say, well, we know where this guy comes from, and then they say, the Messiah, when the Messiah comes, we won't know from where. Yeah. That's not, they're not educated, apparently. You ever watch a toddler try to run? Yeah. <laughs> not they get up, fast. and they get going, they get going, and they get going so fast, and they get so excited, and then... This is kind of what's happening with the crowds, these false starts, right? So they start to recognize this truth, right? They start to, wait, isn't he the guy they're trying to kill? But then he must be the Messiah. But then this other doubt creeps in. The time out. That's Jesus. I played t-ball with him, right? Like, we know who this guy is. We know where he's from. We know his family. He's from, he's from Nazareth. We know this guy. How could somebody we know be the Messiah? <clears throat> no one seems to know that he was born in Bethlehem. <clears throat> well, that's true. But just the fact that they know who he is. Right? They expect someone arriving on a chariot of fire with angel armies, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, honestly, if you look back at history, you know, when they call Saul off to lead, he's plowing a field. When David gets anointed, he's out with the sheep. When Gideon gets called, he's hiding in a hole. You know, I mean, Literally. yeah, when Moses gets called, he's on the run for killing an Egyptian. And he stutters. Yeah. So this idea of God calling people from everyday, ordinary circumstances <coughs> and lifting them up, that's not that, that's really not that unheard of. In fact, if he had done it the opposite, that would be kind of weird. Yeah. But this is, we're not going to have time to get into all of it as we go, but this is the next sticking point. You see that they go in these cycles where they start to believe, they, it's, it's one step forward, two steps back kind of thing. Or maybe two forward, one back, I don't know. But they start to move forward, they start to accept. This has actually been a very important breakthrough because Jesus is only teaching. He's not performing signs and wonders. So they're, they're actually starting to listen. But then they've got these competing voices. Right? 
Jesus said this, but wait, I know who he is. Jesus said this. He made this promise. He made these statements. But this is what I see. But. You ever been there? And those butts can be deadly, right? It's like yet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yet. But that happens to us so much, right? Mm. I was talking to a guy this week who, um, and I, please hear me, I'm not trying to downplay what he was going through. Um, a gentleman in his 50s whose mother had died, and she was in her 70s, late 70s. And he said to me, how can God love me if he let my mother die? Mm. And I don't want to, I'm not, I don't think I'm a completely heartless individual, but I thought like, you know, I mean, I know she didn't live as long as the queen, but she had a good run, right? You're a grown man. You got to adulthood with your mom. I mean, of course we always want our loved ones longer, but I mean, this isn't a Job situation, right? But sometimes our hearts and our minds let those kinds of things happen. They, they let these obstacles get between us and God. Well, why would God love me if he lets this happen? Or if God really loved me, he would answer my prayers. Or if God really loved me, he wouldn't make me wait. You know, if Jesus really is the Savior, the world wouldn't look like it is. If, and we've got, all, we've got all these things that, you know, that the father of lies whispers in our ears. Mm-hmm. And that our hearts... That's what I was thinking about reading this. I was thinking about Eve, you know. Did he really say not to eat? <laughs> Did he really say you would die? You're not going to die. Not yet. Yeah, those, those tricks, right? Those tricks. Did he really say? Now, um, you mentioned a second ago about knowing where Jesus was born. Is that something they would have known? Where the Messiah was supposed to be born? Yeah, because it's in the Old Testament. It's in Isaiah. Yeah. Does it say in the Bible that the Messiah will appear out of nowhere? Mm, that's why I'm thinking that it seems like they really say that. <laughs> when the Messiah comes, he will simply appear. No one will know where he comes from. That's what the people say. Like but does prophecy say that? The chariot Prophecy specifically tells us where he's going to be from. Yeah. Be careful of folk theology. Folk theology. That's a good word for it, right? Define that, yeah. Define that. Okay. Would you like to define that, brother, or would you like me to? Uh, uh, back when I was in seminary, that was a, that was a big term that we, uh, that we kept hearing about. But folk theology is, is theology is developed with, within uh, the the congregations uh, and within within the, the gr- big bigger group of people who attend Christian churches, typically around your cultures within in each individual church. So, in other words, uh, you'll have a Nazarene folk theology that mm-hmm. usually follows uh, particular generations. Well, we've always done it that way, and therefore it must be right. Mm-hmm. Um, or uh, it uh, boils down to a local church. Well, uh, no one wears their hair that way. Uh, when I when, one of the pieces when I was uh, growing up, I went to uh, I was associated. I had my grandmother attending the Nazarene church. My my other relatives uh, attended uh, uh, with us the missionary church, which was a small Mennonite. Uh, type holiness denomination, and uh, and then there were uh, folks who were real Mennonite, uh, Mennonites, and uh, uh, and then you had the Pentecostals, which we all knew about but never associated with. It. So well, and, you can hear them a mile away. So. Yeah. And, uh, so you, uh, and uh, you could tell the Pentecost, you could tell the uh, the uh, Nazarenes because their hair, the women all had their hair in a bun. And you and you could tell you could tell the missionary church because the women all had bubble cuts. If you remember your mother's bubble cuts, and then, and then and, and you could tell the Pentecostals they had the beehives. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. And, 
there's there are all kinds of versions of, of that. Uh, you know, if you're raised one hand, you're a Nazarene. If you're raised two hands, you're a Pentecostal. You raised no hands, you're a Baptist. Sorry. This is folk theology. Yeah. Um, so I'm just replying to a comment. And another, uh, I, I just say it, another type of folk theology is is that um, the Nazarenes believe, uh, of course, Nazarenes believe that uh, that everyone can, uh, can lose their salvation, and it, and they for that reason they they all think they uh, lose their salvation every every day. If you have a bad dream and die in your sleep, you'll go to hell. Yeah. 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 Maybe another another pop theology example could be the prosperity gospel. Yep. Right? If you give to God, God will give it back tenfold. $1, right? $1, if you $1, empty $1, your savings account, God will give you a Cadillac. Right? I mean, you know who ends up with the Cadillac. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So pop theology sometimes is folk is the same thing. Yeah. Sometimes folk theology or pop theology is a gentle misguidedness and gentle ignorance. But it's very often manipulated by people who want, want to control the crowds. Yeah. Yeah. Now, another one on the other side, folks, and, and this is a good lesson. Uh, there, there are some uh, of other denominations. We'll just say Baptist. I have tons of Baptist friends. With, with I grew up with some of this because I attended Baptist churches, and they would say that we sin every day in word, thought, and deed. That's if you were to talk if you were to talk to a Baptist pastor mm -hmm. and now they would say, No, that's not true. That's not true. They believe in holiness mm -hmm. too. But but the the people, the folk would believe. Uh, they, they heard somehow that you you sin every day, worth up and deep. Mm -hmm. No. Yeah. So this is something we have to be on the lookout for. We've mentioned this a little bit in our uh, Wednesday night study with Ezekiel, but remember, there is a time now and a time coming when there will be false teachers. There is an Antichrist coming. And this kind of teaching, this, t this subtle twisting, that's how heresy gets a root. Right? And what is the counter to that kind of heresy? True knowledge of the Bible. The Bible, right? To read it, to talk about it, to know it. What we just read, right? When the Messiah comes, he will simply appear, and no one will know where he comes from. What's the counter to that statement? Isaiah. Exactly. Let's go back and read Isaiah and read everything they say about the Messiah. Yeah. Exactly. Perfect. You see, you even knew the right book. Perfect. You know, that's the counter to this kind of teaching. Um, we had another comment here. Um, from Dexter Gist. Hello, Dexter. I don't know if we've met before, but thank you for joining us. He made a comment about Jesus coming to serve and not be served. Um, but he made a comment about the way Lazarus' sister responds when Jesus comes and she says, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that's an, that's an excellent point, right? right? If, you, if, if you had been here, this wouldn't have happened. Now, we know what Jesus was about to do. Right. Yeah. But imagine if she had taken that a step further. If she had smacked him in the face and stomped off and said, get out of here. You couldn't stop this and you didn't. Imagine how different that would have been. But that's the point of surrender to Jesus as Lord, right? It's trusting that he knows best and that he has our best at heart and that he's able to do it. Those three things together, right? God's perfect timing. Yeah. And God's perfect timing doesn't always feel perfect when you're in the middle of it. Exactly. Right? Mm -hmm. It doesn't. It feels really hard. Mm -hmm. Now, when we look back, nine times out of ten, we see what God was doing, right? But when you're in the middle of it, it can, really, it hurts sometimes. Right? Lazarus family is a great example. Right? We know that at the at the end of that day, when Lazarus came out of the tomb and hopped out all wrapped up. They must have had the biggest party. They must have celebrated. But the, the three days before that, the three days of mourning, 
Well, that he was wrapped up. That's what he would have been like, right? The three days before that, can you imagine how miserable they were? Jesus could have healed him, and if he was here, this wouldn't have happened. And three days of him being dead. Yeah, that's agony. I'm sure on day two and a half, it didn't feel like God's perfect timing. Now, on day four, yeah, Lazarus is here, right? But man, in the middle, it's hard. And we see that those middle parts of the journey, those are the stickiest, right? Whether it's wandering through the desert or being on a ship in a storm, or think of when, when Jesus is being tried, what Peter goes through. Mm -hmm. Those middle times, that's when our faith is the hardest. In the beginning, there's an energy and a joy and a thrill, right? We've just learned something new. I'll drop my net and follow you, right? And in the end, there's a maturity, right? I understand the way Paul, when he writes Philippians, is a good example of this. At the end of the journey, there's a maturity. But in the middle, that's really, really hard. And that's when we need to spur each other on to good works, to encourage each other, right? Yeah. The, uh, Adam Clark had about this thing about where, not knowing, and he has some, some interesting things to say, but I thought about this. The rabbis at this time had a, had a, a proverb, the three things come unexpectedly. A thing found by chance, the sting of a scorpion, and the Messiah. Interesting. It, uh, and they confuse one for the other. Yeah, yeah. It, uh, it and he he says uh, uh, it was it was probably you know this thing about they didn't, don't know where they come, but pro where really they they do take it from Isaiah fifty three uh, that but it's from whence who shall declare its generation? But the the the. The issue there is the virgin birth, and and so it's it's they needed to seek deeper. It's not they they they, they should have known the place where he came from, but they wouldn't know how he yeah. how he came here. I will, and just to throw another wrench in the works, they could have listened to John the Baptist. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> so there's that too. But sometimes it's hard, right? When we get set in our ways and we get expecting a certain thing. Um, this is the last thing, and then we can have dinner. Um, when Jennifer and Harrison were sharing last weekend at the mission gathering, they were sharing about how when they were called to serve as missionaries in Peru, they were called to be work and witness coordinators. So that means they are the ones who coordinate the projects for all of the short-term mission trips. So people from all around the world would fly in, and they would do different kinds of jobs, run VBS, build churches, build orphanages, all, all kinds of stuff like that, right? Um, a lot of people in this church have been on these kinds of trips. But because of the COVID travel restrictions, they didn't have any teams coming in. So they had been called by God, they accepted the call, they moved to Peru, and then they couldn't do what they were called to do. And instead, they ended up teaching Sunday school in a local church. And then, that church had planted a new congregation, and they needed somebody to pastor it, and they asked Harrison to pastor it, because he just got ordained last year. This is not what missionaries do in the Church of the Nazarene. You don't pastor a church, right? But God had different ways. He said, he actually put his hands up like blinders. He said, we had an idea of what God had called us to do, and we were trying to look in that direction, but God had something over here. <laughs> God had something over here. And he helped share his heart and his passion with that church. They, they started working with kids in the neighborhood, uh, not so different from what's going on here, you know. And um, God made it, God did a new thing, right? Another Isaiah passage. See, I'm doing a new thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we've got we've got to be careful, right? We need to stand true to God's word, because God will never never take us against His word, right? But He often takes us against our assumptions. Yeah. And thank God for that. Um, all right. So Dexter made another comment. He said they missed the whole point of God sending His Son to die on the cross. Um, he quotes John three sixteen. Yeah. Yep. Lazarus died again physically, but Jesus died so we might live forever. Amen. That's true. 
I will say this is where we give them a little bit more credit back. We're reading this in hindsight. We have the whole, we have the full gospel, right? Yeah. We have we have all four gospels to read the story, and so we already know how the pieces are supposed to fit together. So that makes it a little easier for us. It can sometimes when you know how the pieces fit together, you can think it should be inevitable that people would understand that. But it's a journey. It's a journey. But yeah. All right. Well, let's close in prayer, and then we can have a uh, beef stew and cookies. Sounds good to me, right? Beef stew and cookies. And rice. Oh, and rice. Yes. And lots of butter. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's pray together. Father God, thank you for your word. Thank you for all the different perspectives you've brought together here tonight. Thank you that we can read your word and learn something new each time. Thank you for our friends online and what they are sharing. And, and thank you for our life experiences and our experiences with scripture that come together to form this wonderful journey. Father, thank you. Your word is precious to us. And I pray, Father, that our lives would demonstrate that. That we would treat it as something as important. That we would hold it as an authority over our lives. That we would spend time and effort in reading it and learning it and stewing in it and hiding it in our heart. Father, thank you for your word and help us, help us please to treasure it. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right. Um, Thank you, everybody online. Dexter, it was nice to meet you. Thank you for sharing, brother. Um, we're going to say good night to Venus, and good night to Jane, and good night to Eric, and good night to Cody. Thank you, everybody, for joining us online, and we'll see you again soon. Have a good night.